Hi there guys, got a bit of a different video here for you today. What we've got here is a Daystate Mark IV, more specifically a Daystate Panther. And unfortunately, both the LCD screen and the board itself have blown up. Now this isn't one of our rifles, we've been asked to look at it for a friend. And unfortunately what he's done is connect a laptop charger to the charging port on the back of the rifle. What that's done is fry both the board and the LCD screen. If we were to connect a battery up to this rifle, LCD screen wouldn't work, neither with the board, and the rifle would be pretty much dead. So in this video, what we're going to be doing is fitting one of these. This is called a heli board, and is a direct replacement for the standard factory board. It just goes on there like that, in place of the original. So first thing I'm going to do is remove all the connections on the board. Firstly, the pressure sensor. We're just gripping that lightly and pulling the cable out. Next, I'm going to come through with some tweezers and just hook or unhook all these connections here. The first one we'll unhook is the lock. So that's the one with the yellow wires, the small connection with the yellow wires. The next one we'll unhook is the green one, and that's the trigger connection. And then the last one at the back here is the charging bolt. Once all of those are undone, we can disconnect the coil. So the coil is a little trickier. What we're going to have to use is a small flat bladed screwdriver. Push it between the connection and the locking tab and then pull the connection out. And there we have it. There's all the connections unhooked. Next thing we can do is flip the rifle over and remove these three screws here. Once all the screws are off, what we need to do now is gently hold this small board. So this one here, we need to gently hold onto that and then pull the bigger board off. The little board does separate from the big one. It can gently be pulled off like so. There we have it. So there's the old board. This is pretty much scrap and we can now put that in the bin. The next thing we'll do is remove the LCD screen. So first thing we'll do is loosen and remove these two screws in the top here. Now the screen should be loose. Once that's done, we'll lift the rifle up and then gently unhook the ribbon connection by pushing on these two connections here. With that done, I'm going to pull my LCD screen out nice and carefully. Now, obviously, if you were leaving your LCD screen on the rifle, you wouldn't need to loosen the screws and you wouldn't need to remove the LCD screen from the rifle. But since our one isn't working anymore, we need to remove it. Next, what we're going to do is come back with the heli board and fit this to the rifle. So to do that, we'll flip the rifle on its side push the connections through so they don't get caught up as we put the board in. Lay the board on the end like so, and then reinstall the three securing screws. Once they're all tight, we can flip the rifle over once more. And at this stage, if you had your LCD screen installed, you could reattach the ribbon cable. But as R1 is a separate unit, we're going to have to fish it through the block. Nice and carefully like so. Give us a bit of slack. And then fold the connection on itself. And get it hooked up into the ribbon connection down there. So if we take a look in the block there, you see that's where the ribbon connection goes. And then we obviously need to push down the two locking tabs, one on either side, so that you can see that one there. It's just that little brown thing. So that part there. There is another one under the coil wire. With that done, we can put our new screen over the front. And 
and fish the ribbon cable through. With that done, we can just take our ribbon cable, fold it on itself, and then hook the excess back up into the block. The hammer runs in a sleeve, so we don't need to worry about the ribbon cable getting caught up and wrapped around the hammer. With that done, we can start reattaching all of the connections. So we'll start off with the pressure sensor at the front there. Get that nice and installed. And then we can start moving on to the connections in the rifle. The first one we'll do is the coil wires. So it's a unique connection for the coil wires. And it's pretty hard to miss if I'm honest, just the big connection. And that's just located in this area here. The next connection we'll hook up, which is this one, the first one, will be the lockout switch or the lock for the rifle. We're just going to hook that up. Next up will be the trigger, which is the green connection. And that will go in connection number two, so this one here. And then the last connection will need to be done with this little fly lead that's included in the Hello Bald kit. So this simply hooks into the connection on the board, like so, and then this one here acts as a jumper lead between the two. It can be hooked up like that. So I'll get you a good look at the connections, and hopefully that makes sense to you. With that all done, we can make sure everything's poked away nicely and that there's no sticking up wires or any pieces of material that are inside the rifle that are going to cause us ag. The next thing we'll do is make sure that the safety actually connects with the safety switch, which it does on my rifle. So you can see that there. If this switch isn't being depressed fully, you may need to slightly bend this trigger shoe out or this shoe of the switch out a little so that it comes in contact with the safety bar. Depending on your make and model of your rifle, this safety bar is a few different diameters. So some are maybe thinner than others, and you may need to bend that shoe out just a little in order for the safety to work properly. So if we take our battery now, install that in that plug there, we see that the screen lights up nicely and everything's working exactly how it should. There we go. So the heli board has been installed correctly. The next thing we have to do is program the rifle to get it to the correct power. Before I go ahead and do that though, I do just very briefly want to bring back the original screen and the original plastic housing and show you why we couldn't use them. So the original screen uses a soldered on ribbon cable. So this is non-removable, soldered on from the factory. The LCD screen that we installed in this rifle has a removable cable so you can unhook the connection, pull the ribbon cable out and the LCD screen comes out as one piece. Now that particular design is about one and a half mil deeper than this one. So we couldn't use the original plastic housing because number one, it's got a ear broken off. So in there, that broke off as we was taking it apart. And number two, it's a bit deeper. So this plastic housing is no good. What we had to do was remake one out of aluminium which is just a tad bit deeper. So it's about a mil and a half deeper to suit the new screen. But with that all said and done, we'll get this put away and I'll get the rifle programmed and I'll bring you back when we've got the rifle programmed and I'll walk you through how to do it. Right then guys, so I've spent a few hours with the rifle now and I think I've got a set of settings that I'm happy with. So before we begin, I just very briefly want to explain how this rifle works. This rifle does not have a traditional mechanical regulator. It instead regulates hammer strike to maintain a constant velocity over the cylinder pressure. So if any of you are familiar with unregulated guns, they normally have sort of a power curve. Typically speaking, they'll be slightly low at the top end of the fill pressure and slightly low at the bottom end of the fill pressure with a sweet spot in the middle. This rifle uses the electronic board to regulate the hammer strike, meaning that it changes how hard the hammer hits the valve 
throughout the field pressure to maintain a constant velocity. In this section of the rifle here, there is an electromagnetic coil with a steel hammer that runs up the center of it. When we energize the coil, the hammer is pulled towards it and the hammer strikes the valve. There are two ways that we can change the power of the rifle. Firstly, the capacitor voltage, and secondly, the pulse width. So the pulse width is the length in milliseconds that the coil is energized for, and the capacitor voltage is the voltage that's applied to the coil. The higher the capacitor voltage and the longer the pulse width, the higher the power will be, and also inversely, the lower the capacitor voltage and the lower the pulse width, the lower the power will be. Now, obviously, the ball doesn't know what power we want, and it also doesn't really know what it's doing. So we need to program it to tell it what to do at certain pressures. I will explain how to do that very shortly. The first thing we'll do though is just go through the screens and through a few menu options. So up here in the top left, we have the current cylinder pressure. Next one is the estimated shots left. This is user settable, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Next one is at the power level. So there are 12 individually settable power levels that can range from anything really. So this is a sub 12 gun. So power set in 12 will be just under 12 foot pounds. Then the rest of them can be whatever we want. On this rifle, I've set it so that it gradually drops down in power the further down the power setting we go. Below that, we have the current battery voltage. This ranges anywhere between 7.7 .7 and 10 volts, with 10 volts being a fully charged battery. The last two relate to the things that we were just discussing. This one is the current pulse width at the current pressure. So for example, at the moment we're at about 140 bar, and this is the current pulse width of the rifle. Once we shoot this down, it will change. So this is the variable that changes as we go through the cylinder pressure. And lastly, in the bottom left-hand corner, we have the capacitor voltage which is a constant throughout the cylinder pressure. So this doesn't change as we shoot the rifle down. The default is 69 volts and I have left it at 69 volts as I found that to be a pretty good setting as it allows us to get the power we want without having to use excessively long pulse widths. But the minimum is 62 volts and the maximum is 74 volts. With that said, I'll show you how to get into the menu of the rifle. So we have to flick it on safe, pull and hold the trigger, then flick the safety back on. And as you see there, we cycle through the various menu items. Once we get to the end, it just tells us to turn the switch off to either return to the regular screen, or if we want to, we can pull the trigger again and go back into the menu. So I'm just going to turn that off and we'll go to the individual power levels. It's the first menu item. We'll release the trigger when we're on the item that we want. And as we can see here, as we click through the trigger, the power level changes. So we're going to stay on 12. So I'll push and hold the trigger, saved, and then it tells us to turn the switch off and back on again. And up here we have the power level. The next one we'll go to is capacitor voltage. So if we wanted to change the capacitor voltage, we'd simply stop the selection at that point there and if we were to click the trigger, it would increment the capacitor voltage 0.1 volts at a time. We're going to leave it at 69 volts. But if you wanted to change that, that's how you change it. And when you've got the setting that you want, you just push and hold the trigger. Saved, and it then prompts us to turn the switch off again. If we changed the capacitor voltage, we would see the new value here, although we didn't change it, so it's still at 69 volts. I am aware that my battery is running low, but we're just running through the menus now, so I'm not gonna swap out the batteries. The next thing we'll show you is how to program the rifle. So we're looking for calibration, which is there. Here, we have the option to set the different pulse widths at different cylinder pressures. How we set the power on this rifle is fairly simple, although a little tedious. What I done was dry fired the rifle down all the way down to 70 bar. I then hooked up my inline regulator, which is one of these things. So this connects onto our bottle and allows us to set the fill pressure of the rifle independent to the bottle pressure. So if our bottle's reading 250, we can easily set the fill pressure that we want to fill the rifle to on this side to whatever we want, all the way down from about 50 bar all the way up to 250. So we set our inline regulator to 70 bar 
and then altered the pulse width until we got the feet per second we were looking for. In our case, we was looking for about 710 feet per second with JSB heavies. Now on this particular rifle, I wasn't able to achieve the feet per second we were looking for at 70 bar, and I found anything above 1420 on the pulse width didn't produce any additional power, so I just left it at 1420. As we shoot the rifle down, as it gets below 70 bar, the power just slowly decreases. Once I'd done that setting, I moved on to the next pressure setting, which is 80 bar, as denoted here. So if we go through the menu here, on this side we have the current sunder pressure of the rifle. In bars at the bottom and in bits at the top, you don't need to worry about the bits, that's just how the program reads the pressure and does its little calculation. In the middle here we have the setting that we're currently altering, so at the moment we're altering the setting at 80 bar. Over here we again have the pressure in bits, and we also have the pulse width just down here. The only thing we can alter on this screen is the pulse width. So when we're at this stage here, we altered the inline regulator that I just showed you, turned that up to 80, and then altered the pulse width until we got the feet per second we were looking for. Again, 710 feet per second with JSB heavies, and I will mention that this rifle is a 177 rifle. To alter the pulse width, all we'd need to do is press and hold the trigger for three seconds, wait for the little flash that you saw in the top left hand corner there, and then we're able to alter the pulse width. Once we've pushed and hold the trigger for three seconds, the next trigger press alters the thousand numeral, so the first one there. Anywhere between 1,000 and 9,000. 1,000. Press and hold the trigger. That moves us onto the next decimal. So this is, will be the hundreds. Again, once we're happy, press and hold the trigger. That little flash pops up again, and now we're altering the tens. So we can go through all the way up to nine. I'm going to set it at zero as it was for 1,405. And lastly, we'll alter the individual digits. Once we're happy, push and hold, data saved. So if we altered that then, all we'd need to do is flip the rifle back onto the normal mode, fire the rifle over the chronograph a few times, take the average feet per second, and compare that against our target. If it was too high, we'd obviously need to decrease the pulse width. If it was too low, we'd need to increase the pulse width. In my testing, using JSB heavies, a change in pulse width of around 15 milliseconds was enough to change the feet per second by around 10 feet per second. Although that does alter by cylinder pressure and will obviously vary between rifles. But then we just carry on repeating the procedure, so The next setting would be 90 bar, then 100, then 110, all the way up to 260. Now the rifle itself is not a 260 bar fill. The settings above 230 are just overruns and are to be ignored really. From memory, this rifle is a 230 bar fill and should not be filled above there. As this rifle is fairly old now, I have leveled off the pulse widths so there's no real point in filling it above 210 but that's the general idea you work your way up trying to keep the feet per second consistent as you increase the fill pressure once we was done with that what we did was disconnect the tether then shoot the rifle down over the chronograph to make sure that it was all all right once that was done you can continue going up and down tweaking and changing the pulse widths ever so slightly to try and get the rifle a little flatter throughout the power curve as you see here the gap between the settings is 10 bar but you don't need to do every individual bar the computer can work out it sort of graphs the difference between the two so you don't have to actually manually go in there and change every particular bar it creates a gradient across sort of a 10 bar average if i'm honest it all sounds much more complicated than it actually is once you actually get to sort of programming you get the feel of it and it's pretty much just easy especially if you're running a tether like me if you didn't have an inline regulator what you'd need to do is consistently fill your rifle up to the set pressure that you're currently working on so that you wasn't getting false readings from the values but again it all sounds much more complicated than it actually is the last menu i'll show you is the actual 
shot calculator. And this is where you input the data to help the rifle estimate how many shots you've got left within your fill. So over here we have two values. We have minimum pressure and we also have the pressure change between shots. In our case, we're not interested in anything below 80 bar, as 80 bar was the lowest we could get the rifle before we started to drop in power. And once you're on this screen, any trigger presses change this value first. Now I've already got it set to 80, so I'm not gonna touch the trigger. As if I'm honest, it's a lot of clicking to get back to where it is set. Once we're happy and we've set the minimum pressure, we press and hold the trigger for three seconds to move on to the next setting which is this one bar per shot and to work this out it's very simple what you do is you take your current pressure so say for example we're at 160 bar we then take 10 shots and record the change in pressure so say we go from 160 to 150 that would be a pressure change of 10 bar so obviously 10 shots that would be a pressure change of one bar per shot so we'd enter one in this calculation here. Once we've got the value entered, it's just a case of pressing and holding the trigger for three seconds to confirm the data and then flicking the safety on and off to go back to the home screen. And once we're on the home screen, we can actually see the estimated number of shots we've got left within our fill up here. Now you may notice that this has changed from the last time you saw it and that's just because when I was filming this video I actually noticed that I had the minimum pressure set at 9 bar rather than 80. That was just a mistake, I must have changed the setting without realising a little while ago. But that's the reason for the discrepancy. The last things I'll leave you with is my current settings for this rifle throughout all 12 power settings. So they should be on screen now so you can pause the video, copy them down and do whatever you want with them. You could try them in your rifle if you've got a heliboard. Obviously they will be different between each rifle, every single rifle will be slightly different. So it may not be a direct copy and paste into your rifle, but these are the settings that I'm running in this particular rifle. Right then, with that said, I'll get you back over to the bench. Right then, so in regards to the heliboard, I am really quite impressed with the results we was able to achieve from it. On screen now, I'll show you a full shot string of the rifle, straight from full up at around 210 bar, all the way down to around 80. This is a 100% complete shot string, so absolutely zero pellets taken out. And as you can see, the shot string is incredibly flat throughout the entire fill of the rifle, and we got a very nice consistent shot string. I am looking into getting a one for my Red Wolf, and if we do end up getting one, I will be making videos on it, as if I'm honest, I really am impressed with the heliboard. It was a nice little project to fit, it was a fairly interesting thing to program, a little time consuming if I'm honest, but once you actually get used to pushing the safety and the trigger and all those sorts of things, you do get used to navigating the menus pretty quickly. My only complaint really is it is a little fiddly, but I understand it was probably done so that you could do it at the bench with no additional tooling. Having said that though, the results really do speak for themselves, and I'm really happy with how this little project turned out. The last thing I'll do is get you a close-up of all the little bits. So obviously we made the aluminium housing there, and it looks quite nice if I do say so myself on the rifle. It is obviously a little fatter than the original one to compensate for the thicker LCD screen, but there's not a lot we can do about that as the original housing was pretty tatty and one of the ears had broken off inside, so it wasn't able to support the actual LCD screen anymore. There's the board there, just in case you need a close-up of the connections, but I'm really quite happy with how this project's turned out. The only other thing that I've got to show you in regards to this project here was just some photos that I took whilst I was machining the housing for the LCD screen. I'll put them on screen now so you can see them. I didn't take a video of this little project as it was just something I was doing for my friend when I had the time. It's not a very complicated part to look at but there are a few tricky features to machine on a manual mill such as the rounded corners and the chamfer that runs the outside edge. And to do them, I used the DRO with some of the radius features and lots of coordinate milling. But there's just a few pictures of it before it got anodized and installed on the rifle. And before I forget, once everything was done and we was happy with it, we did pack the back of the LCD screen with some dielectric grease just to stop the terminals from corroding. 
So it's pretty much all ready to go back to my friend. Unfortunately, I can't put it back in the stock and I would have liked to shoot it to see exactly how good it is, but I wasn't given the stock with this rifle. So unfortunately, I just can't do it. With that all said and done, guys, that's going to do it for this video. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.